Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, lead pastor here. I'd also like to welcome you. Um, we are in the middle of a series leading up to Easter, which is next week. We're excited about that. And what we've been doing is just kind of walking our way week by week, just kind of through the different points of the gospel and kind of what it is we're celebrating and why we celebrate on Easter to kind of get our hearts ready. And uh, I was thinking this week on one of my favorite things about my, um, my job is uh, when kids... Uh, want to get baptized. When, it, when a kid wants to get baptized, what happens very often is a parent will want to come, have their kid come talk to me because they just want to make sure that their kid's ready and all these things. And, and I love to do it. I love hanging out with kids and so glad to do it. And so you're sitting there talking to the kid. And you start asking them questions about why they want to get baptized and why they want to get baptized. You know, it's, you know, get a whole range of options. And you start talking about, you know, it's, you know, it's what you do after you become a Christian. Can you tell me what, is it, what does it mean to be a Christian? It's like, you have Jesus in your heart. And you're like, that's a great answer. It's a total great kid's, kid's answer. You got Jesus in your heart. Well, tell me what that means. And they'll say something. And it's like, well, how do you become a Christian? And you start asking enough questions, and eventually you're going to get the money answer. Right? Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Right? Jesus died on the cross for their sins. That's what they're going to say. And that is it. That is the gold answer. That is, they know it. They've been they've been trained for a long time. If if you want if you want the the extra piece of candy, if you want the um, the 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 applause of the teachers, that's the go to, right? Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and like and I and I, and I affirm that. Like that's great, that's great. And so, but here's what I want to. That's kind of the thing we say a lot at church. It's kind of one of those things that gets repeated a lot. But I got a question. When you say Jesus died on the cross for your sins, what does that mean? And then kind of a like a blank stare comes across, right? You can just tell. It's like they, they've kind of been used to this idea of you just say that and you win. So like, well, what does that mean, though? We say it. What does it mean? And they're thinking. And, and I'm not requiring, you know, some 8-year-old to have, you know, seminary training or anything. It's cool that they're stumped a little bit by, by that answer. It's fine. It's what, it's what we're here for. We're here to talk about this. But here's my best, here's my most favorite part. My most favorite part is... They don't really say anything, and so then I turn to look at the parent. Not that I'm wanting them to answer, but they're scared to death that I'm going to, and this look on their face of like, I don't know either, and they're just, they're, the color drains out of their face, and I just give it just a second before then I just start talking. And I'm never planning on asking the parent. It's just, it's just a sick little twisted joy that I get <laughs> in, my, in my day. So... Because, because, because here's, here's the reality. Um, that really is kind of the, the thing, man. It is, it is the gold answer. It is, it is the most significant theological statement that I think of, of what we believe. It's one of the, the most important points of our life for us to really grapple with. And too often, I feel like that a lot of us kind of remain stuck at a seven- or eight-year-olds understanding. It's like, I don't really know what it means, but I know that it's important, and I know that it's, it's good. What does, it, what does it mean when we say that Jesus Christ died for you? What does that mean? And so we've been kind of working our way through these significant passages in Romans. We're kind of beginning to just kind of just deeply explore what that means as we're getting ready for Easter. And today we're going to be in Romans chapter 5, and if you have an actual book, I encourage you to put a bookmark there. If you are using an app, I encourage you to do whatever it is your particular app does to kind of highlight this chapter. It is one of the most significant passages in all of Scripture, and I think better maybe than any other passage helps us really answer and grapple with this question. When we as Christians, we talk about who Jesus is and what He did and what His death on the cross means for me, and we can move beyond just that something Christians say to the deep personal and theological significance of Jesus' death for me. Romans 5 is your go-to passage. So I encourage you to highlight this in some way to where it, it, can, it can become a part of, 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 of the Bible for you that you know is incredibly significant. Okay, so we're going to start Romans chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Stop right here just for a second. You're going to see this a lot. Paul's going to use 
varying versions of kind of the, the golden phrase there multiple times. This is what he's talking about here. It's like, hey, you see, you think about this. At just the right time, we were powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Again, Christ died for sins. Verse 7. Trying to explain a little bit what he means here. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, here's the phrase, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So he's explaining here to the Romans. He's basically explaining to them, kind of, you know, for those of you who, who don't even know, know at all, I want you to know this is what Jesus Christ did. But I think for those of us who may know a little bit about this, he's trying to help us in a, in a deeper way understand what this means, what did Jesus' death really do for us? And so to make sure that we kind of get everything that's going on here, we'll kind of review the last couple of weeks because he kind of gives us the whole picture here. And he uses some, some different and sometimes even stronger words than some of the other passages in Romans we've looked at. And so uh, in verse 10, Paul says it this way, For if, while we were God's enemies, and I think that's an important point for us to make sure we understand, that we were God's enemies. This is what Paul's saying. He's like, we were God's enemies, and if there's not a part of you that when you hear that, you used to be, or maybe you still are, you're God's enemy. I, mean, I just, that just feels a little strong. Feels a little overstated. I mean, I get this idea. We've talked about it for the last couple of weeks. We're a sinner. I've done bad things. I've, but we, it's kind of how we talk about it. Yeah, 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 I'm a sinner. I know I've done some things wrong. I've damaged my relationship with God. I'm not everything I could be. I've hurt God in some way. I'm hurting me. And we talk about sin, not that we deny it, but we, we, we try to put it in a little bitty box. It's like it, it's a box big enough for me to deal with. I recognize, yeah, that I'm, I've been this bad. I've not been enemies bad. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not God's enemy. And God, God loves everybody, and, and, and he, God doesn't have enemies. And if he does, it's Satan, and I'm something, but I'm, but I'm not that. And there's a few things that I think it's important for us to kind of take away from this. To, you know, if, if we are kind of having a, an objection of sorts to this. The first one, I think, that for some of us, we need to kind of change our default position to where when we read something in the Scripture, we just, yeah, okay. That's what God says. This is God's description. And I think it's important for us, even if we're wrestling with it and trying to understand it, that our default position is to say, all right, well, this, if this is how God characterizes it, then, then, then that's what it is. The second thing I would say for those of us who kind of struggle with that word is that I think sometimes we make God just a little too small. I, I, I think we don't recognize how big and great and good and overwhelming and holy God is. If God is so great and God is so big and God is so amazing, to sin against that God is significantly bigger. It's a significantly bigger deal than I think that what most of us make it out to be. And God, because God is overwhelmingly big. And I think we also need to understand this concept that really rebellion against an authority figure eventually at some point makes you an enemy. You know, and so, you know, if you, if you tell your parent, you back talk your parents, you know, I mean, they're not going to declare you an enemy. You know, you, um, you don't turn in your homework. Teacher's not going to declare you an enemy. You roll your eyes at your boss, you're not an enemy. But there comes a point, let's just be honest, there comes a point where your rebellion gets significant enough where you really are casting yourself as an enemy of that authority figure, whether it's a parent, a teacher, a boss, or whatever. 
And I think if we recognize how powerful and overwhelming and good and holy God is, then we would understand that even a small amount of rebellion makes you an enemy of God. Any sin on your part makes you an enemy of God. And so even if I'm willing to argue that your sin is relatively small, which is not something the Bible talks about, relatively small sins, relatively small sins against a relatively amazing God is a huge deal and puts you in the enemy category. And I think that's important. I think it's important for us to kind of accept the weight of what it is we've done and how amazing God is. Again, we talked about this for the last couple of weeks, so we're going to hang out here forever. But there's something else that he says here, again, at the very beginning, verse 6. You, you see, at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So we were God's enemy, enemies, and this, we were helpless to do anything about it. So, so far, Paul has described us as enemies of God and powerless You are in a situation where you find yourself on the wrong side of the Almighty Creator God of the universe, and there is nothing that you can do about it. And again, you might bristle a little bit at that. Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I just finally choked down the idea of enemies, and now you're throwing powerless at me. None of us like to imagine ourselves as powerless. Sure, I've done some bad things, but I've also done some good things, and I think those good things cancel out the bad things. It is such common thinking for people to come up. But we're thinking about it in the wrong way. And and I've said this before, and I'm just going to keep saying it again for like, I don't know, ever. Is that we think of our relationship with God in terms of good and bad. I am more good than bad. I'm good enough. I'm better than you. I'm relatively good. I'm good. But the Bible talks about it in terms of of law-breaking and law-following. Either you are a lawbreaker or a law-follower. And once you break the law, there is nothing that you can do after the fact that makes it where you didn't break the law. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you go to the the traffic court, and it's like, you've been accused of speeding. And you'd be like, no, but I didn't speed on the way here today. I mean, that that doesn't have anything to do. You not speeding today does not mean you didn't speed on this day, you are still a lawbreaker. But now you think you've got me. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. But they do give you leniency based on whether or not you have a, a, a track record. If you are generally someone who does not get pulled over for the least, they give you leniency. You don't get the worst thing. They'll give you all a warning. And sure, man, I've talked myself out of, out of a handful of speeding tickets back in my day and um, varying, charming, vari- the various charming members of my family have done the same, right? You talk yourself out of it, I'm sure. Some of you have managed to do the same feat. But have you ever tried to talk yourself out of armed robbery? So you're there at uh, the, the court. You just robbed a bank. You say, but judge, I've only robbed the one bank. I've never before or since robbed any other banks. So, by definition, I'm really not a bank robber. It's just the one time. It doesn't really work that way. Maybe for a speeding ticket, but not for violence, not for robbery. And that's what we're talking about here. A sin against God is not a speeding ticket. It is a big deal, and there is nothing that you can do to make yourself no longer a lawbreaker. You can, you can follow all the laws but one, and you still broke that law. Unless you can go back in time and stop yourself, you are a lawbreaker. And a lawbreaker, as Mark talked about last week, the wages of sin is death. If you have broken the law, what you have earned for yourself is death. And there isn't anything that you can do about it. Again, this is an idea, a a, a terribly bad theological idea that we're all going to have to kill. It is not two goods is better than one bad. It is not I'm 80% good and 20% bad. That's not how it works. God thinks in law terms 
not relative morality terms. And we have all broken the law, which puts us as God's enemies, and we are helpless to do anything about it. You cannot unbreak a law. But as always, we've talked about this in all the passages we've looked at so far, as always, we never get stuck on bad news. But it's only in a full, deep understanding of bad news that the good news becomes great news. So we don't stay there. So go back here to what I believe is one of the most important, powerful verses in all of Scripture. Romans 5, verse 8. So he's talking about all these things. Ungodly, describing us as ungodly, powerless enemies, all these things. Verse 8, but... God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, and here's the phrase, Christ died for us. So we were God's enemies, and we were helpless to do anything about it. And here's the comma, comma, but Jesus died for our sins. This is what Jesus did. He died for you. It's the phrase that, again, is, is all, it will be all over Grove Kids today. It will be all over Grove Kids on Easter Sunday. It's a thing that we're telling people. It's a thing that I think that most people, whether or not you're fully a Christian or not, if, you're, if you come to a church and you have enough familiarity with Christianity, you understand on some level that that's what Christians believe. Something about sin, something about Jesus' death has something to do with that, and that is what Christians believe. Jesus died for sins. And so now, like a group of seven-year-olds hanging out with the pastor, we ask the question, but what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus died for me? And there's a lot of different things out there that people say. There's some... There's some bad books out there. I hope you're not reading the wrong books, and I hope you're not listening to the wrong podcasts. Because they're out there selling some, some weakened uh, ideas about what it means that Jesus died. They'll, they'll say things like, you know, Jesus loved us and loved God so much that He showed us how to live, and He, di- he was willing to die as a martyr for us to show us how important all of this was. Or He died for us to be able to see what a great example of being committed to God is. And He did that for me. He did it for me so I could see how important God is and how loving Jesus is, that He was willing, he, even as He was being accused by these people, He did not back down because He wanted to show us who God really was and that, and that love and compassion that was meant for you. I don't even know what that's supposed to be. I don't even know why people are saying it. And if the book you read is saying, you need to take the book and you put it in the trash and you need to delete the podcast. Because that's something, but it is not what Jesus Christ did. When Jesus died for our sins, we mean something much more theologically significant than that. And this, and Paul's explaining it here for us. He says, verse 7, very rarely, he's kind of doing these hypotheticals, rarely someone will die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. So he's putting these scenarios out there, right? I mean, would you die for somebody else? And, um, you know, and I don't know, you're, you're, you're watching these shows, like crime shows. My, my, we used to watch comedies in my house. I don't know, I'm not saying my wife got weird but now we just only seem to watch things where British people are killing each other. And um, but it's fine. I like a good murder, I guess. But they, they, um, they, they, um, they, you, they, you find yourself, you watch enough of these, and you just you, you find that people get into these ridiculous scenarios, right, where they're having to make some, some choice, you know, whether or, not you, whether, or not you would, whether or not you would die for somebody else. And, you know, and they're like, one of you is going to die, and then somebody has to step up, right? And, and I, you watch these kinds of situations where someone's going to have to sacrifice themselves for everybody else. And, I, and, and you're just kind of imagining you, right? Would I, would I do that or be like, eh. like, you know, is, we need a volunteer and you, you step back, right? You know, it's like, wh- who would I die for? 
And I think about that, and I'm like, I, th- I think I would definitely die for my kids. I think I would definitely die for my wife. And I, I don't know, maybe. Is like, this what he's saying here? It's like maybe, maybe if you're standing next to a, a good person, maybe you'd be willing to die for them, maybe. But Jesus, while we were sinners, he died for us. And so what Paul is clearly talking about here is dying in the place of someone else, which completely makes sense because in the next chapter, the passage we looked at last week, this is what he's talking about when he talks about verse, uh, verse 23, chapter 6. Mark talked about this. For the wages of sin is death. You, you've earned death for yourself. That's what you've earned. I owe a death. But the gift of God is life through Jesus. So I owe death, and what Jesus did, he died for me. He died in my place. Now, note takers, you ready for your fancy theological term for the day? Substitutionary atonement. It's like substitute, but you make it longer, so it sounds fancier substitutionary, right? Substitutionary atonement. Atonement is making a a payment for something. So Jesus made a payment. He paid for you as a substitute. You owed a debt. He paid it on your behalf as a substitute. So here's how I explain it to the kids at the the pre-baptism, right? So I was like, tell me what the the worst punishment in your house is. And again, the parents get nervous because they think it's like suddenly now we're evaluating parenting, Right? But it doesn't really matter to me in that moment whether it's spanking or grounding. Screen time, the denial of screen time seems to be large on the minds of kids now. You know, and, and, but whatever it is, I was like, well, what's, what's the worst thing that you, you could do? Was, well, you, don't, you, don't go into, you don't go into mom and dad's room and, and, you, don't, and you don't mess with their stuff. It's like, okay, great. So your brother, your brother goes into your parents' room and starts messing with the stuff on, 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 on the shelf there. And, and breaks something. The kid gets all big-eyed. What's going to happen? And then whatever the giant punishment is, that's gonna, well, he's going to get that. Okay, great. So, so, so mom and dad, they find out. They broke, they broke the thing. And, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're mad, right? Like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And they're going, and they're, now here comes the punishment. But right before they're about to get the punishment, you stop them. You say, Mom, I, I didn't go in your room, and I didn't break the thing, but I don't want you to punish my brother. Punish me instead of my brother. Would you do that for your brother? And here's the thing. The kid at this point thinks it's a trick question. Where the answer is supposed to be yes. They go, yes, I would do that for my brother. And then I start mocking the kid. No, you would not do that for your brother. That would be ridiculous. But most kids, most kids by and large are pretty honest. Would you do that? No, I mean, I get enough trouble on my own. I don't need my brother's trouble. Right? And this is what Paul's talking about. Who's, who would do that? But that's what we mean when we say substitutionary atonement. That's what we mean when we say Jesus died for your sins. You owed a debt. Again, a debt that you were unable to pay. Well, I guess you can pay it. But, you, but it's with your whole spiritual life for eternity. There's nothing you can do except pay it. You're powerless. You're helpless. You owe an insurmountable debt. But Jesus died for your sins. He died in your place so that you could be forgiven and that he would pay that debt for you. Like taking a punishment that your brother, for a crime he committed. Jesus is taking the punishment for a crime that you committed. Say, I will accept that punishment on all of your behalf. And so then that leaves us with the decision. Am I going to continue to pay this debt? Or am I going to let Jesus pay it for me? Now, if you're here and you've never really fully embraced the gospel, you've been kind of living at a very shallow idea of what it means to be a Christian, you've never really admitted the depths and the seriousness and the consequence of your sin, this is your moment. That's why I've been talking about this. We've been talking about this primarily for the people who don't know. 
who have not yet experienced. And I pray that you would allow Jesus' death to be also for you. But our hope is also that for people here that have, um, no, I, I get it, is that we would just really allow as we're getting closer and closer to Easter, kind of let it sink in in a, in, a, in, a, in a more powerful way. But there's, a, there's, a, there's another part of this passage, and I'm going to be honest with you, it just kind of really jumped out at me for the first time this week. Again, this is a passage that I've studied a lot, that means a lot to me, but every now and then it just kind of happens, there's kind of this, this, this new alarm bell kind of goes off where I see or experience something that I don't, I don't know that I had before. And it gets in, it's in this verse where he talks about um, being enemies. Verse 10. It says, for if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And I think for me, I'd always just kind of gotten caught up in the fact that, that Paul's talking about enemies. Like, enemy, enemies just kind of jumps out in that verse. We're God's enemies. Like, whoa, that's significant. And you just kind of hang out there for a while, and like, that's the point. And then, then in my mind, what that verse says we were God's enemies, Jesus died for sins. But that's not what that verse is saying. What he's saying is, now think about this for a second, guys. You used to be an enemy of God. And when you were an enemy of God, what did God do for you? He gave you perhaps the greatest gift one could ever give. He sent his son and his son gave his life for you. So you were down here and God did this great thing for you. This is how God shows love to his enemies. That's, that's how much God loves. Do you see that? This, I mean, you are an enemy of God. And he showed you this much love. That's what he says, okay? While you were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through his death. How much more, having been reconciled, again, enemies, now friends, Having been reconciled, shall we be safe through his life? If sending Jesus to die on the cross is how God shows love for his enemies, how much more will he show love to those who are his sons and daughters? I think way too many of us, Jesus died for my sins, that gets me in. That's the good thing that God did for me. And now I'm on. Now I'm coasting. Now I'm now. Well, now I now I go to church because that's what you're supposed to do. And now I'm just trying to be a good person. But God did the thing He was going to do. He did that big thing for me. But Paul says, "Like you don't understand. Jesus died for our sins, but that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. How much more?" Will God love you and save you through his life? While you were his enemies, he, he did this great thing for you. How much more will he continue to do for you now that you're not his enemy anymore? Now you're his son. Now you're his daughter. What if, what if Jesus' death on the cross is just the beginning of the love that the God of the universe is wanting to show you? What if the greatest, most selfless act in all of human history is just the starting point for the love of God in your life? How much more will God save you through His life? He wants his life in your life and he wants to continue to bless and love you at a level that I would say is beyond our comprehension and Paul's trying to communicate to them and ultimately to us you are settling for something quite ordinary and Jesus is offering you extraordinary So as we do every week, I think this is a perfect time for this. 
of real theological, personal, spiritual reflection between you and God. I would just ask him, God, what is the more that you're wanting to do? Where am I settling? Where am I just coasting? What in my life are you trying to save through your life beyond just reconciling me back to the Father? What is it that you're wanting to do? What is this love that you're wanting to show me? What is that? I promise you this. God has multiple answers to that question in your life. And honestly, this sermon, and I believe this series as a whole, really is just meant to be kind of a launching pad for us and our personal reflection on who Jesus is and what God's sacrifice of His Son for you, what it meant to you when He did it, and what He's still wanting to do in your life and through your life now. How? much more is God wanting to do in your life? Let's just spend some time doing that. Obviously, you can do it at your seat as you worship. We have opportunities in the back as well. There's prayer candles. There's communion available. You don't have to be a member, just a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a cross you can play, pray at. The prayer team would love to pray with you. We have an opportunity to give. Lots of ways to spiritually and personally reflect but whether you need to receive Jesus for the very first time, you need to let that truth sink in deeper, and or you need to experience much more. Let's ask God, God, what are you, what are you wanting to do in my life? What is that much more? What does it mean to me that you died for me? Let's pray. God, again, I just, I just thank you for that passage. God, just the truths that Paul speaks there. and That 2,000 years later, God, we are all, as your followers, still just learning and experiencing that and just understanding it. And it is so rich. And God, I pray the truths in that, God, would just sink deeply into our heart today. And that, God, for those of us who do not know you, that we would stop paying for something, God, you paid for us. And the God, that we would let your death be for us. And God, I pray that the significance of that would sink deeply into the hearts of all of us. And that God, that we would live life with the expectation that there is much more out there that your love in our lives is just beginning. And we thank you for that love. We thank you for that it was demonstrated in your son Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.